people who are going to come to this game and comment. Do you want to? Okay, so do you want to yes, start? Please. Yeah, I will be sitting down there. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have Rajiv Day. He's co-founder of Entership, <laughs> sorry for my English. Um, and he's the co-founder of Startup Britain. Um, he's going to talk about how he became an accidental entrepreneur. Here you go. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yay, cheer, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I like you already. <laughs> um, it's quite a small crowd, so actually I'm going to try and go for maximum participation if possible and try and get to know a bit more about you guys. Um, but it's not, it's not about um, the quantity, it's the quality. So thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm the founder of internships.com. So some of you might have seen in the marketplace um, that we've got a presence there. Have you guys checked out the marketplaces yet? Have you seen our presence? Good stuff. So, and I'm also the co-founder of Startup Britain, which I'll talk to you about in a second. So this presentation is called um, A Story of an Accidental Entrepreneur, pretty much because that sums up my life and journey to date. Um, I, uh, this is kind of my third venture that I'm doing, but, but all the things that I've done to f so far weren't kind of set up intentionally, kind of happened by accident, I'll t and I kind of explain that to you. So just to get a sense of who's here, how many of you are current students? Can you just raise your hand? Oh. Great, most of you. Good stuff. Um, how many of you entrepreneurs got your own business already? A few of you, a few of the same hands as well. Brilliant. Um, how many of you are working in a startup? <laughs> I know you two work for internships, that's good. Um, how many of you work in a corporate or in academia? Ah, oh, good. good. Um, and how many of you are looking for new opportunities kind of in between kind of things? Cool. So the ones of you, the, the guys that are kind of in academia, where, where, are, where are you based? you based in the UK or, where, yeah? And what, are you guys at university or, okay? What, what are you studying? Okay. Yeah. And you go, law? Yeah. Business studies. And you're in academia, you're a professor? You work for Tata Monica. They're on internship. Very good. Brilliant, brilliant. That's what I like to hear. And the guys who've got their own startups, raise your hand again. So, what's your startup? Okay. Actually, could you? That's great. In Madrid. Brilliant. Good stuff. Are you part of the Wire Accelerator or? Oh, well, I, I was in the, you were? In the past edition. Okay, brilliant. And who else has their own startup? From the front here. I'll get to you. I like you guys. I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, so I have a company, uh, we develop automated proofreading software for academic writing and okay. we've just been through an accelerator. Okay. So Which recent. accelerator? Uh, Dot Forge in Sheffield, okay. heard of nice. it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do a lot of work, accelerators, good stuff. And there was another one here, I think. No? We'll come to you, what's your startup? You're eager to tell me, which is good. Tell me your, what's your startup? I sell weave. <laughs> you sell weave? Yeah, As in hair, hair weave. Okay, cool. Hello. Yeah, good stuff. Anyone looking for hair weave, you know where to go. Brilliant. So you always take the, every opportunity you can to kind of get a shout out, get a plug. You never know who's looking for hair weave, right? So, um, okay, so I'm going to break up my presentation, tell you kind of how I got started. What do we do as a company today? The kind of lessons that I've learned on the way. Um, my kind of broader mission in life sounds really grand, but it's not really. Uh, and then take some questions. So um, we've got a hard stop at five to six. But as I said, I want to get as many questions as possible from you guys. If you guys are tweeting, you can tweet me at Raj Day. Obviously, you guys know the hashtag, which is CP Europe. 
Um, so yep, yeah, get to eating as well. So this is how it started. That is not my bedroom, before you ask. That was a mock-up. Uh, I was part of a TV show um, on Channel 4 called Bedroom Britain. Uh, they were looking for kind of young entrepreneurs who were setting up new things. Uh, so I was 17 at the time, no, 18 at the time, um, and I was working on setting up an organization that worked to give school students a voice in their education. So what I felt was that whilst parents, teachers, governors, head teachers, they all had national bodies giving them a voice, no one was ever really asking the customer in the education system who was a school student, what did they think about their own education? And I found out that most countries in Europe had national school student organizations and that we were one of the few places not to have one. So I approached an organization called Unlimited. Um, has anyone heard of Unlimited? A few of you, yep. So Unlimited is the foundation for social entrepreneurs in the, based in the UK, uh, and they gave me a level one uh, award, which is a 5,000 pound grant to go off and set up my own thing. Um, and then the kind of reality really kicked in because it's all well and good having an idea, but when someone backs you with some money, it's kind of like, kind of reality dawns on you that actually you've got to now deliver on that, on that idea and that promise, which is great. And it really kick-started me to set up uh, what at the time was called the English Secondary Students Association, it's now called Student Voice, um, and it really worked to give school students, as I said, a voice in their education. And Bedroom Britain was kind of a, a great kind of platform to kind of showcase what we were doing, um, and that was my first foray into entrepreneurship. So no one at the, at the time, I didn't know what I was doing was being an entrepreneur. I spotted a problem, I spotted a gap, and I wanted to do something to change it. I wanted to make sure school students had the ability to have their say in education. So then I went on to university, um, and for those of you in the UK, you might recognize a few faces. So Gordon Brown was the prime minister at the time. Um, you've got Lord Sugar there, you've got a few of the old dragons from Dragon's Den. Um, and I became president of the Entrepreneur Society at Oxford. So I was studying economics and management at university, and I realized that I didn't really, I wasn't really taking part in university life. I wasn't really getting actively involved. I was really busy working on student voice and working on my kind of social enterprise, um, and that all these opportunities were passing me by. So I found out about Oxford Entrepreneurs, and I thought that this was the closest fit to what I was already kind of working on, um, and I got myself onto the committee. Uh, so there was, a, there was a vacancy for a role of the external relations officer, and it was the best job title, I reckon, in the whole thing, because the, the job description was effectively to schmooze with, with sponsors, bring on speakers, um, wine and dine people, and it was literally probably the best job other than the president to, to have. So got that onto the committee, and then soon became president the year after. I took off a, a year between my second and third year at university to run the society full time. And running the society was very much like running my own business because Oxford Entrepreneurs is one of the largest networks of student entrepreneurs in Europe. We have um, over 7,000 members. It was a full-time job for me to run it with a committee of 18 people. Uh, I had a budget of nearly 100,000 pounds to manage of sponsorship, which I would have to go out and raise. And um, so running that was, as I said, essentially like running my own company. And that was actually what gave me the inspiration to set up my current venture, which is internships, because what I felt was that whilst the aspiring bankers, lawyers and accountants all did internships, what was there for an aspiring entrepreneur to do or someone that doesn't necessarily want to go down a corporate career path? And so we also hear about the fact that there's 4.8 million small companies out there, but they don't have the brands of a Telefonica or a Goldman Sachs or a McKinsey to go out on campus and really attract and recruit talent. And so there's all these wasted opportunities because there's these it's people at university that want to get kind of experience, but they don't necessarily have the opportunity to connect to these companies. So Internships was born. Again, I say accidental entrepreneur because it was never my intention to set it up as a business. It started off as a really simple listing site just for Oxford students to find opportunities with companies that are approaching me, really. So actually, I had about when the, when the site was launched and I was still studying, about 200 companies by the time I'd left had put opportunities on the website just by word of mouth. And for those of you that are still at university, what I'd say is it's, you're never too early to kind of start your own company. So even though this wasn't a registered business, it was just a project. I got a friend of mine who was a computer science student to actually build the website. I got another friend of mine who was a medic who actually did the initial branding. So 
you've got a great opportunity whilst you're at university to kind of tap into the networks of people around you, use the university kind of resources that you have. The, the library will have like research databases of like market research reports. So I really made the most of my time at university and started getting involved with kind of entrepreneurial kind of activities. Um, and now where we're at, we're, we actually now work with over 5,000 companies, um, helping them find talent. You'll recognize some of these companies, but a lot of them you won't recognize. And that's the beauty of internships is that you'll uncover and discover companies you would never have normally come across. You'd never normally think of them as a, an employer of choice, but they can provide you with a really rewarding and fulfilling opportunity. So um, some of these, as in a Groupon, when it first started in the, in the UK, was called My City Deal. They were one of our early clients, and they really kind of grew and took on loads of interns who then subsequently became full-time employees. Um, so there's been some amazing success stories and said we are kind of growing and, and now work with over 5,000 companies. But a lot of this has been possible mainly due to partnerships. So actually a funny story is our first major client, major corporate client was Santander Bank. Um, again, this was an example of how networking, and you might hear this time and time again, especially on this stage, the importance of networking. So I met... Um, someone who was on the board of the bank at an event that we were, we were hosting and he really liked the concept of internships. Um, and actually, we landed our first major deal, which was to create Santander internships, which was a platform to connect their business banking customers to their universities division on the back of a conversation. Because it happened to be that the bank was also considering doing something similar. They've got 62 university partners and they wanted to create an initiative that would help support that. But the funny thing in all of this was this launched back in 2011 was I was still working from my bedroom when this deal got signed. So we had these fantastic kind of legal documents and procurement documents of uh, kind of safety checks and, and all the what kind of security process have you got. And the irony of the whole matter was I was still operating this from my, com my bedroom. It was just myself and one other guy. Um, but that kind of hustler kind of mentality, that kind of ability to kind of sell your vision and to get other people excited is really important um, when you've got a startup. And I'm sure the, the other startup entrepreneurs will agree with that, is that you've got to kind of get across your passion uh, and get them to believe in you. And so Santander took a big risk and took a big punt. I was honest with them about my situation, but they believed in me and the vision and, and that was a big coup for us. Uh, our most recent partnership is with Telefonica. So we're their talent partner for Europe for Wira, which is their accelerator program. And we've launched Wira Internships, which is a platform to connect all of their academies right now in UK, Ireland and Germany but subsequently we'll, we'll be rolling out to the other European academies to talent. So if you're looking at working in a startup which Wira has invested in, then you can go to wira.internships.com and you can see um, the whole spectrum of, kind of companies that are based within these academies. And we've had over 50 roles already um, and we're well on target to actually exceed. We're looking at over 100 um, by the end of the year. So um, one of the key lessons is, this is a quote from Reid Hoffman who says, Entrepreneurship is jumping off a cliff and assembling the plane on the way down. And for me, this really sums it up because you're not necessarily going to have all the answers. It's going to be a bit daunting. And you sometimes need to just take a leap. You've got to take that jump um, and just go with the flow and see kind of what happens. Um, and make it up as you go along in, in many respects, actually. Um, and actually, has anyone, has anyone heard this quote before? Or no? Okay. So... And Reid Hoffman actually writes about it in his, in his book called The Startup of You. Is he's very much taking this kind of startup mentality in, in everything you do. Um, and for me, this is, I typed in the word catalog of errors in Google, and this is the image I got up. So uh, basically, since 2009, when I first set up the business, um, first couple of years was quite disastrous in the sense that there were lots of mistakes, lots of learnings, but you just go as an entrepreneur, you've got to make as you go along with the flow, you've got to learn, you've got to kind of be agile and responsive to kind of what's happening and just don't get, don't take those setbacks um, as kind of disastrous or, or failures, it's really take it as learnings and, and kind of the key kind of test of an entrepreneur, I feel, is how you pick yourself up from that, how you learn and you develop. So during the Q&A, we can go into that probably in more detail uh, a bit later, but just say it was not all kind of smooth going in a startup, and it, and it really never is. So a lot of the companies that you see today kind of presenting here, they've become big brands. If you go back to the beginning when they started, they've probably all got their war stories, uh, and I'm sure many of the entrepreneurs here would kind of um, back that up. 
But now the good thing is entrepreneurship is very much in vogue. So even as a startup, we've managed to get an amazing amount of press coverage, global media coverage, for what we're doing, because actually entrepreneurs are seen as sexy, they're the new rock stars. That is kind of very much what the press are looking for, kind of good news stories uh, of where entrepreneurs are doing stuff. And the, the good thing about, I suppose, with internships is that not, not only is, are we a startup, but we're also doing good in the, by helping young people find jobs at a time when youth unemployment is so high, that's also managed to capture the attention of, of the media. So, um, and actually we've not used any PR companies, any, uh, we've just done it all ourselves. And if you've, I truly believe you've got something good to say, you need to effectively embody your, your business. You need to become the face of your kind of hair weaving company. You need to become like your brand and live it. And, and just like you did, take every opportunity to plug it because you never know there might be a journalist in the, in the audience that might want to come and talk to you after it and hear about your experiences. So when I asked you kind of, what's your business, what you're doing, and said take those opportunities, because a lot of these opportunities that, we, that I got through um, to kind of be featured have been through meeting the right people, making those kind of connections. And what I'd really encourage you to do, it might sound, seem kind of awkward, is like typically you sit next to people that you know, but the great thing is if you know people, split up when you're going to your next talk, purposely sit next to someone you don't know, strike up a conversation, see what they do, find out about them, because it is one of these, these kind of random kind of interactions that really lead to potentially amazing outcomes and it has for me at least so far also adding a bit of celebrity can never ha like do any harm so i was fortunate with the experience that i had at oxford entrepreneurs we had people like stelios dyson sugar come and speak to our students and i kept in touch with many of these people and obviously because it started off at oxford um, so Peter Jones was a, uh, actually all of these guys have been clients, they've taken on people through internships. Lily Allen took on people for her fashion business called Lucy in Disguise. Um, James Kahn has for uh, his investment company. So having these kind of guys as ambassadors or as clients or as testimonials is a great way of kind of boosting your credibility as, a, as an entrepreneur, especially when you're first starting out. And actually I don't know how many of you watch Dragon's Den but um, there was an episode where actually Peter Jones plugged uh, internships when one of the people pitching was pitching a similar business. So again, he had remembered uh, uh, me and the company and we got free publicity on BBC, which led to an amazing amount of uh, kind of people coming in and asking about our, our business. So, um, but as you grow a company, there's gonna be new challenges. And this photo was literally just taken about two months ago and it's already out of date. The team has grown. Uh, there's 18, I think, 19 of us right now. Um, and so as, as you grow, so from my bedroom, which was, it was a different startup, but even internships started in the bedroom, to now there's 18, 19 of us, comes with it a lot of challenges. And as an entrepreneur yourself, it can be quite daunting, especially when some of your employees are older than you, you've got, or generally you've got a, a quite a young team, how do you kind of develop them, how do you kind of do what's best for them and that's, it's a lot of responsibility as an entrepreneur to kind of think about um, the livelihoods of other people that you're, you're employing but at the same time I see it as kind of new opportunities. So we have this, this cupboard in our, in our office where people put post-its on kind of what do they want to learn and what can they offer because actually within our team of 18, 19 people we have an amazing wealth of expertise that you just don't know about. So Hansa, for example, who does our sales, she's got some great sales chat that she could tell people about and she'd train other people about, okay, how to engage with customers, how to get them to do a listing, or Pat, uh, Patrick, who um, does, has basically been responsible for the marketplace uh, presence, is great kind of project management and stuff. So there's a lot that you can learn from each other. So despite being a startup, I think another thing that's important for, for me is to make sure we invest in our talent and that doesn't have to be putting people through MBAs or expensive courses. A lot you can learn from each other and that's what we're trying to instill within internships and one of my colleagues, Will, um, his job really is as kind of, kind of a culture and a learning and development person as part of, as, uh, one of, part of his job is to really work on developing the talent that we have internally. But at the same time, you need to lo know your limitations. So I know that I don't have all the answers. Um, I'm either making things up as I go along or I'm trying to find out the answers if I come across new challenges. And the key is to be able to seek help, is to kind of go out to your network, find out from other people that have been there and done that. And the great thing about entrepreneurs in general is that you'll find them to be 
relatively generous with their time and they want to help other people because typically someone has helped, I know people have helped me in my journey and I'm happy to kind of pay that back and, and pay that forward to kind of other people that are coming through the ranks and setting up their own ventures. So I've done things like Goldman Sachs have a program called the 10,000 Small Business Program, which is an initiative for fast growing businesses to effectively, it's like doing a mini MBA, uh, it's with UCL, um, and, but it's a big investment of time. So you've got to put that time in on top of running your day job and doing your business to make sure you're constantly developing as an entrepreneur, you're getting the kind of uh, the, the tips and the guidance that you need to grow your business. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to be part of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders community and through that um, we have access to uh, the Harvard Kennedy School so we had a, uh, a two-week course there. Um, that photo is a, a photo from a, a group of tech entrepreneurs um, so some of you might have heard Michael Acton Smith from Moshi Monsters so Michael as myself and a bunch of the other speakers that you'll hear here and um, other entrepreneurs are part of this group called ICE. Uh, it's like a tech mailing list of London, typically London um, tech entrepreneurs. And we go for kind of social and like learning events, whether it be ski trips or a trip to Israel to look at the startup scene there or a trip to Africa, which is coming up. But I've learned most of the stuff that I've learned is from my peers and speaking to people in a similar situation. So I suppose the key thing I wanted to stress here is that always be seeking out new information and don't be afraid to kind of tap into your network and ask for help. So I said I'd talk to you about my mission now. So as I said, my journey has been quite accidental, both with um, internships and with Student Voice. It wasn't necessarily that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was more I wanted to fix something that I wasn't happy with. And then I was labeled with the term entrepreneur. But one of the key things is that I feel right now, especially with high levels of graduate and youth unemployment, is we need more and more people to set up businesses that will create jobs for, for these young people. So I'm also a co-founder of Startup Britain, which is the national campaign the Prime Minister launched in 2011 to promote entrepreneurship in, in Britain. And again, this was slightly accidental because it happened to be that I'd met with Lord Young, who was the Prime Minister's uh, enterprise advisor at an event. We got talking about the fact that Startup America had launched a few months before, and one conversation led to another, and they said, wouldn't it be great to have something similar in Britain? Myself and a few friends who are sim uh, entrepreneurs got together and launched this campaign within about a month. So it kind of shows how one random conversation can lead to you hosting an event at Downing Street, and I, that's what I raise this point mainly to stress the importance of networking, speaking to people, because you actually never know who you're actually talking to. Um, I also put up there, for those in the UK, the Startup Loans Initiative. So for, for right now it's for 18 to 30, but I think the, the age limit is going to be removed. If you've got a business idea and you're looking at getting it backed, um, obviously you've got things like a Wira if you've got an established a business startup, but Startup Loans is also a good thing to check out. And so my my mission is really to change this concept and to see entrepreneurship as a career option in its own right. So one of the classic things that you come across is when you go to dinner party and you get asked, what do you do? And you've got the banker, you've got the lawyer, you've got the accountant. Um, and then you come to me and you say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. And then you get an, almost a sense of pity from the people in the room. They're like, oh, didn't you get a proper job? Is kind of the kind of some of the mentality you might get. And, and that's kind of the attitude that I want to uh, challenge and say actually entrepreneurship is a career path in its own right um, and actually we should be celebrating and supporting those people that are willing to take their risk um, and venture out on their own, create jobs, create wealth uh, for the economy so that the, you'll be proud to say that you're an entrepreneur. More and more people can say that they are entrepreneurs too. So my final question to you guys is who is ready to jump? So thank you for your attention and now as I said I'm open to taking questions. Thank you. Who's brave enough to ask the first question? Feel free to use the opportunity to plug your own ventures and whatever you want to do. Yep, yeah, back there. If you could just say quickly who you are and kind of where you're from as well, that'd be great. Um, my name's Joshua Akinsola. I'm from London. I'm going to Goldsmiths University. Great. Um, I wanted to ask you about the ICE. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on that, yeah. please? Yeah, so ICE Group is uh, kind of an, it's just a mailing list, really, of tech entrepreneurs based in London. They're quite selective in terms of how you get on the list. So you've got to come on some of the trips. You've got to know existing members. But the premise started off as a, 
as a group of about five or ten people that were having dinner regularly to talk about business problems and then they moved that to becoming a mailing list and it kind of grew and grew and I think now there's about 150 entrepreneurs on that list so if I have a problem I literally I put it on ice and I, I get five or six responses within minutes of like okay uh, how do I deal with this issue or that issue? Or there was a reception last night and there was a message on I saying which, how, who, who's going to the launch reception. So it's, it's basically a, um, a mechanism to network with other startup entrepreneurs. So some of them you'll know, like the, the CTO of Eventbrite's on it or uh, Mike from uh, kind of Moshi Monsters on it. So, but uh, other guys who are literally just starting. So it's, it's just a way to kind of interact with um, like-minded people, predominantly based in London. A few people are in San Francisco and New York as well. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Keen to hear from the other kind of entrepreneurs in the room. Have you kind of had similar, any kind of similar experiences or what's your kind of, your startup journey been? Has there been any parallels um, I think I, mine is more like more typical, perhaps. Yeah. Like you start on a high, and then you, you know, yeah. go down. So right now we're in the, you know, after no. the accelerator, no yeah. investment, uh, hustling, trying to, you know, running yeah, after right people. Right. Hey, let's meet up. Let me show you our prototype. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Pitching at events. Um, we're taking it, you know, taking it slow. Yeah. We don't want to do that because we know it's like four or five months of just chasing people. Absolutely. Uh, we've met a number of successful startups. All of them have gone for this. Okay. And the average time it takes to get the investment, if you don't get it straight away, is maybe like a year, year yeah. and a half. Absolutely. And we are not ready to jump in that way. Sure. So we're going to get like part-time jobs, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's more, more of a reality check on, on what Yeah, absolutely. Well, the other thing is, so I'd never actually raised money for the venture for quite some time because I wasn't comfortable taking on other people's money until I was clear what was happening with it. So the, the time we only did a small uh, friends and family round back in 2011, but by that time we already had companies using the site, we had a big corporate client, and we had revenue coming in. Um, and what I would urge entrepreneurs and all people looking at setting up to think about is, it's not necessarily the golden ticket is not to raise money and you're going to be a massive success. So actually not having money can force you to be creative, to kind of hustle a bit more, force you to go secure paying customers who are willing to, and sometimes you've got to do things that you might not want to do, like creating platforms and stuff is great for us because it kind of brings in revenue and we can, we can work it with partnership. But Sometimes it means that what you want to build in your core platform might have to suffer because, or be delayed because you're working on delivering what your clients want. But, you're, but you, need also, you need them to keep you going as a business at the same time. So you've got to make those sacrifices. So I, I would also say, because I know there's been a lot of talk about raising money and accelerators and stuff, but those that are thinking about it don't think that it is the only ticket to success is raising a shed load of cash. Um, you can do a lot with very little. And actually, I think that discipline of trying to get the most out of, of very little. So my first venture, 5,000 uh, pound unlimited grant, um, got me going uh, and subsequently enabled us to create um, Student Voice, uh, which has helped thousands of students now. So similarly with internships, started with literally no money out of my bedroom, but it's, it gives you that discipline, that rigor. But obviously it comes a time where you either have to get those paying customers or you need to find someone to fund you. And so doing a part-time job on the side is definitely a way forward. Yeah. Other stories I've heard is people, you know, selling stuff at uh, yard clearances and, you know, doing whatever. Any yeah, kind whatever of it job, takes. Just, yeah. yeah, whatever it takes. Absolutely. It's a more relaxed approach. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? What are the students? So the, you guys doing your internship, what are you guys planning on doing afterwards? Any, any ideas? It's a bit early. I'm just wondering if being actually part of a society of entrepreneurs actually makes a difference. Where are you studying? At Coventry. At Coventry. So Coventry, I think, has uh, as an enterprise society, as far as I'm aware. Have you, have you come across it? There's like an economic society. Yeah. Economic society and business society, so but... I think it makes a difference. It doesn't have to be, like, if you don't have an enterprise society, a good thing is to set one up, because you immediately can become the president of the enterprise society. It might be a membership of one, but, you know, it's a great thing to put on your CV. And that ultimately, depending on if you want to set up your own business or work for an employer, employers are going to be looking for kind of those signals of where have you shown that you're proactive, have you taken initiative, um, and so getting involved with stuff like that is great. And also, if you're part of an enterprise society, often there'll be 
be running business idea competitions. We used to run a competition called Idea Idol, so like Pop Idol for business ideas, give away 10,000 pounds for people with interesting business ideas. So until you're part of it, you just don't know what you might be missing out on. And also the opportunity to network with high profile entrepreneurs that might come and speak at the society. Coventry might have some great alumni entrepreneurs that might come back. So it'd be great for you in terms of building your network. I think a lot of people, especially at university, don't realize that you really need to start early in terms of building up your connections and getting that experience because the job market as it is is pretty bleak. And so the ones that the one, the, those of you that are doing stuff like this, doing internships and getting that experience and really helping making your CV stand out it, are the, be, be the ones that are going to be successful. Thanks. Right. Any other guys here? Just shy bunch. Um, I'm kind of at the other end of the scale for these guys. So I've been working professionally for about 12 years. Yep. And every day on the way to work... I sit and think about what could I be doing. So when I get my amazing idea, what do I do next? So it's obviously I'm going to give up my hundreds of thousands of pounds a year career. Yeah. A great idea isn't enough. So what yeah. do I need yeah. as well as a great idea? So actually, you don't have to necessarily just chuck it all in straight away. So doing the uh, people call it the five to nine kind of yeah, thing so emma, so emma, emma jones yeah yeah, yeah. so emma's a co-founder of startup britain as well so she talks about this a lot it's like doing it on the side building up the especially when you have that risk where you you're giving up something quite stable to do it <laughs> yeah it's a massive job that to, to go do this uh startup but I'm personally not a massive fan of really elaborate business plans. It really depends on what kind of business you're doing. If you're doing a tech startup, um, especially in our space, it's, it doesn't really cost much to start up. And often, if you can find yourself a developer to work with, or you can even do courses, so there's things, stuff like Makers Academy, where you can do a 10-week course um, and teach yourself Ruby on Rails or development skills, just or do Coursera courses online um, and build your own what they call minimum viable product. Just build some pro working prototypes. So for me, it was a case of having the basic internship site. Even before it was a registered company, it was a, just a site that was working and it had a few hundred companies putting opportunities on there, which made me think, okay, there's something here for me to invest more time and effort into. So do you know? Do you already have an idea that you're potentially... Yeah, yeah, I've got What a, kind of area would it be in? It's quite tech. Okay. Or it, it's, it's web-based. Yeah. But it requires a load of coding. Okay. And quite a lot of clever stuff. So heavy yeah. investment. Yeah. So I think having mentioned that, a, a working prototype, so it's almost building a, doing a video mock-up of yeah, something, exactly. getting it out there, seeing if enough people go, yeah, that's, that's interesting. that works for me. Yeah. Is that the right... Absolutely, exactly. So get the, the basic crux of what it is just out there get feedback so when I launched uh, more formally internships we did this kind of closed beta where we said okay we're going to invite a hundred companies to we're going to invite a hundred companies to use a platform so it's very kind of selective and what happened was a, a blog called Springwise which I actually recommend you all read um, covered it and what happened was we had a few hundred companies applying to be part of the beta. I ended up letting a lot more than a hundred use it, but there was that kind of creating that sense of like, this is kind of a opportunity for you to take part. It's free for you to be part of the trial. And we had something for them to interact with. And that we use that feedback to then develop the product further. It doesn't have to be an amazing product and you don't have to have thousands of people using it, but it, it, it shows potential investors that you've got something going. But the main thing I'd say is find yourself that technical co-founder because one of my big mistakes uh, when I talked about catalogue of errors, that whole catalogue is probably summed up by not having a technical co-founder. So being a sole founder that's not technical was, has been my biggest weakness because initially I outsourced stuff, which turned out to be a disaster. Then, well, I also did what they call a sweat equity arrangement where you basically give away a percentage of your business to get people to do stuff for you. That also didn't work. Um, and eventually it kind of forced me to go find and hire developers full time. Um, so if I did it all over again, what I would do was make sure I found a technical co-founder who would work with me from the start and they would have the same amount of vested interest. They would get equal amount of shares in the company and they can get you that prototype that you need to then subsequently bring in the investors and bring in the, uh, the kind of users. Cool. Last question. So yeah. I'm doing this to get rich. Yeah. Um, it sounds like, so the, 
internships and the things that you've set up where I've been really socially motivated. Yeah. What's, what's your motivator? So for me, money's not my motivator. Boom, and, and I boom. actually feel, I actually, I think that if money is your sole motivator, my, I, my personal feeling is it will be tough because at least at the beginning of any business, it is, you just don't earn any money. It, is, it can be really a hard slog. And for me, I feel that the money will follow. It's like, and everything I do has to have a social benefit in it some shape or form. So this is a for-profit venture and there is a, there's a solid business model and behind it, but it's not the thing that drives me. Making an impact, doing, being happy, and doing, waking up every day feeling good about what we're doing is what kind of drives me. So, and the money then follows. So I think it's, it's an important question. And for some people, they do it to get rich. But then my fear there is that you, you set yourself up for disappointment because the ones that it is tough at first and it might, it might take you three or four attempts to get the world beating company that will make you your millions. And so it, it depends on if you've got that kind of tenacity and that ability to kind of stick at it. If, if your focus is the money. So that's, that would be my one... It's, a, it's the challenge, isn't it's it? It's a challenge. That's why, that's why we do it. Yeah, that's why absolutely. We do it. It's the absolutely. Challenge. But, um, but yeah, I think, and, and for me, it's, it's making sure that there's, and everything I do, I want, there's, there's a financial side, but there's also the social benefit. Um, and with Wira, for example, they've launched the Wira Unlimited uh, Accelerator, which is specifically for social tech ventures. So if any, any of you have an idea uh, which has a social benefit as well, you can apply to Wira Unlimited uh, to, in terms of excel, uh, as an accelerator. Well, any other questions? No? Okay. So I've got just a couple of just last slides to just leave you with. So um, I've mentioned Wira internships. Uh, you can have a look at on Wira Street down there, like the range of kind of companies that are based over there. Um, if you go on wira.internships.com, you can see the kind of opportunities, internships that are available. Um, we have uh, the marketplace. We've got 50 companies over the next few days that are going to be there. So they're going to change every day. So even if you've been to the internships area, Go back again tomorrow because there are going to be new employers there. Um, as I said, 50 employers over 200 jobs available. So any of you looking to either do an internship or get a full-time job, go and meet those employers. At 7.40 today, we're running a session with Power. So if any of you have seen the Power stand, it's a really awesome stand where you can interact and play some games. At 7.40, they've got their CEO and a number of their top executives, which is in that igloo kind of thing, which is right next to the Power stand. Um, so go check that out. Um, on the same time on the Thursday, we're also running another panel with a number of tech startups to talk about work, look, life working in a startup. And finally, if you did have a question but you were too shy to ask, there is a Twitter chat happening at 6.30 to 7. Um, you can tweet me any questions um, and go and see us on the internship stand in the marketplace. So thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of Campus Party. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv D. Thanks for coming.